Hey, I, I wonder tonight if I was just to get you to close your eyes for a minute and think of your happy place, what would come to mind? What would come to mind? I, I mean, for some of you, might, you might be uh, imagining something along the lines of a, a beach getaway on Vanuatu, sipping on a, a martini with a summer breeze in your hair, or maybe for you, you're thinking of uh, being out on a, a quiet golf course early in the morning with no one there, but just some birds and you and your clubs. Or maybe uh, for you and my wife, your happy place is being in the middle of a crowded shopping center with... <laughs> Like $500 worth of gift cards and 70% off everything, right? Nikki, that's you too, is it? Uh, maybe, maybe for any of our teenagers, you would just love one day on Fortnite uninterrupted. That's your happy place. That's what you want. Or maybe for you, what came to mind was the world's happy place, Disneyland, right? Yeah. How many people have been to Disneyland? Quick show of hands. It is the happiest place on earth. And... You know, you roll up to Disneyland and there's all the, the smells of lovely turkey leg. There's the thematic sounds of all the um, amazing rides. There's, there's smiling faces. There's characters. It, it's all the bright colors. But the thing about Disneyland is as you get closer and closer and you see the price tag, the happiness just subsides a little bit, right? And then you get in and you've still got a little bit of happiness left and then you realize, uh, the length of the lines and your happiness drops a little again. And then as you hop into one of those lines, you get stuck there with a crying baby for the four hours that you're lining up and your happiness pretty much reaches rock bottom. You see, happiness, right, is a, is a surface feeling and happiness is fleeting, right? It's based on happenings or happenstance. And I'm sure we've all had situations like that. Now, I wonder if I was to ask you to close your eyes, but rather this time, I want you to think of your joyful place, what comes to mind? Like, what's the difference, right? Is it just the Christmas version of the happy place? Everyone's got Christmas hats on? I don't know. I mean, the, the question that I, has been bouncing around in my head as I've been preparing for this message is, is honestly, what is joy? I mean, we sing about it, we, we talk about it, we pray for it. But the reality is sometimes it's a little hard to understand what is joy? What's the difference between that and happiness? I mean, what is Jesus talking about when he invites us to experience joy and have a fullness of joy? And as I've been spending some time learning and growing in this, I genuinely have come to the conclusion that I think joy is a feeling and it's an experienced emotion. So it is similar to happiness. However, joy is not a surface feeling. It is a little bit deeper than that. You see, joy is not a, an idea. Joy is not a conviction. Joy is not a decision, although your decisions can affect your joy. Joy is a feeling. Now, the reason I say that is because you can't fake it, right? You can't fake joy. You can't manufacture it. Uh, you, you either feel it or you don't. And that's how emotions work. Are you with me? And so if you were to go uh, camping, and you were to wake up in the middle of the night and look outside your tent and there's a silhouette and it's the big T-Rex from Jurassic Park outside your tent, right? Like in that moment, you feel something, right? What do you feel? Yeah, afraid. Something along those lines anyway. You feel that. Now, you don't need to sit there and go and calculate everything and go, hang on, I'm probably meat that this thing likes to eat. No, you just feel it. And in the same way, when I was, you know, nine and opened up on Christmas morning, a brand new action man toy with a motorbike, I didn't need to sit there and consider how I felt, right? Like, I, I was like, yes, mom, this is the best thing ever. There's an automatic response because joy is a feeling and it's an emotion. Now, of course, those who know Galatians 5 would know that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So it is a byproduct of life lived in step with the Spirit. So you can't just create joy, but joy is produced in you. And joy is produced in you based on deeper rooted things. And so I wanted to ask the question today, if uh, let's say sadness is the feeling that is rooted in loss and heartbreak, and hanger is the feeling that is rooted in hunger, and maybe uh, self-doubt is anchored in comparison. What is joy connected to? 
Like, what is it that, that will affect my joy? And there is a, a beautiful passage in Romans 12, and Paul, um, in light of Jesus, talks about what it looks like now to live uh, a life following you, a, a life following him. And I absolutely love this. It's a really short passage right in the middle of a, a brilliant exposition on Jesus. He says in Romans 12, 12, get this, be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. But those first four words, be joyful in hope. In other words, let your joy be produced by your hope. And not just any hope. Of course, Paul is talking about hope anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I really do believe that joy is just a byproduct of grounded hope. Now, the reason I say grounded hope is because hope needs to be placed somewhere, right? Like it needs to be put in something or someone. And of course, like an anchor, the more steady that something or someone is, the more steady your joy will be. Are you with me? So, for example, as a, a lifelong follower of Liverpool Football Club, thank you, thank you, thank you, amen, hallelujah. So if I place my hope in them, Man, I am joyful this season when they are doing really well. But the last 14 years prior to this have been very difficult, <laughs> right? Because if my hope is placed there, them winning games will determine how I experience joy. Are you with me? So joy is anchored in hope. And if you have your Bibles, I want us now to turn to Hebrews 12. And we're going to just sit here for a little bit. I mean, again, another beautiful passage that I want to just take a moment to, to highlight. Hebrews 12, 1 through to 3. I'm reading from the NIV. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. How good's that? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And I just want to take a moment to ask the question, what was the joy set before him? Quick brainstorm session. What was the joy set before Jesus? What was it? You can say something. That's okay. Oh, hey, I like that. Uh, hey, Matt, you're good. Yeah, I, I mean, as I look at this and I reflect on this, man, the joy set before Jesus was union. Union with God the Father and union with his people, right? So you were the joy set before Jesus. Your family were the joy set before Jesus. Your community and his reuniting with God the Father. And man, that hope, the hope of union, kept him so steady that he endured the cross and praise God that he did. And so Jesus uh, experienced an overwhelming sense of joy, not because of the events on the cross. Like Jesus wasn't crazy. He wasn't sitting on the cross giggling. No, Jesus experienced an overwhelming sense of joy because of the outcome of the cross, right? He was filled with joy because he knew that through the cross, he would once again be able to dwell with his people, that God and man would be reunited, heaven and earth reunited, Savior and sinner reunited, God restoring all things. And so joy is a felt emotion or experience rooted in the assurance and the hope that God is good and that he is in the process of making all things right. You see, joy is less about a good situation and more about good and grounded hope. And I love this passage. I love Hebrews 12 because it highlights something profound. And it highlights something that we don't often talk about in church. And it's the very fact that joy and pain can coexist. 
In fact, sometimes joy is experienced most when pain is experienced most. And I think so often we think joy and pain are like the opposites. Joy and mourning, joy and uncertainty and change. But that's the paradox of the kingdom of God. They actually share the same room. Catch this, right? Jesus' greatest joy was experienced hand in hand with Jesus' greatest pain. His greatest joy experienced hand in hand with his greatest pain. You see, joy is not always about smiling or sharing the verse of the day every five minutes. Joy is not insanity, but joy is rooted in hope. It's anchored in the assurance that God is good and that even when I don't see it, he's working. In fact, he is in the process of not just working in my life, but redeeming, restoring, and renewing all things. And you've seen this before, right? People walking through the fire of life, and somehow joy is spilling out of them. People that have lost a loved one or uh, have lost a job. Man, it's an amazing thing. Joy and pain can coexist. In fact, right now, I'm sure there is someone on your row that is holding this tension. And can I just take a moment, if you're feeling that at this, at this very present time, can I just take a moment to honor you and to celebrate you and to commend you and thank you and encourage you to keep walking? Because by doing so, you are actually echoing the footsteps of Christ who, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. In fact, right, I just want to take a moment. We're just going to stop the message. I just want to take a moment to pray for people who are facing severe pain. I don't need to know what it is, but God sees it. And I want to take a moment just to pray that you would be able to experience an overwhelming sense of joy in the midst of pain. Is that all right? Can we just take a moment to pray? You with me? Is that all right up the bat? Yeah, great. Thank you. Lord God, I just thank you for brothers and sisters in the room who are holding this tension are close to heart right now, who are experiencing suffering, mourning, pain. And Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit and by your grace, would you pour out your love? God, would you be so present with them in their pain that they would begin to understand that joy and pain can coexist when their hope is anchored in you, our sure foundation. So be with these people as they continue to walk out the tension. And by doing so, Lord, follow in your footsteps. We pray grace and blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, good. We want to celebrate people that are holding that. You see, the beautiful thing is there will come a day where we don't need hope anymore because our hope is realized by heaven being reunited with earth and... On that day, there's going to be no more pain and no more mourning, and what a beautiful day that's going to be. But until then, we place our hope somewhere secure. And so my question for you today, you figure out what to do with it, is where is your hope? If hope is an anchor, what are you anchored to? And if joy is the byproduct of hope, well, this actually matters because it'll determine how you experience life, whether you experience it with joy and peace or maybe with pain and regret. So where does your hope lie? See, maybe for you, you've placed your hope in your career in your ability to kind of climb the, the corporate ladder to get to the top, so to speak, or, or maybe for you, you've placed your hope in your own ability, in your own ability to fix and solve and, and, and sort out the problems in which you see. Or maybe you've placed your hope in another person. The uh, ability to fix and solve and figure out all, you've actually placed in maybe your spouse or, or your kids. Where does your hope lie? Maybe you've placed your hope in your ability to understand and, and to know, and you keep seeking and keep seeking, but you're not finding anything. Or, or maybe you've placed your hope in your bank balance. And every time you're worried, you just take a look at your, your bank account, not me, Good grief. It's okay. Pray for us. <laughs> or maybe you've placed your hope in progress, in our ability to solve all the issues that we face in human advancement, in technology, and all of those things. Now, 
hear me, I'm not saying any of those things are wrong, but the trouble comes when we place our hope in them. Because the reality is, things will fail you. Sorry to tell you, people will fail you. Your understanding will fail you. Your body will fail you. And we can place our hope in things that are fleeting, in things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Or friends, the invitation stands for us to fix our hope in the unshakable, unchanging nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, it's easy for us to assume that um, as I come into relationship with Jesus, I place my hope in him. But the longer I live, the more I begin to understand that uh, hope is multifaceted. So rather than having one big hope chip that I place on the table of Jesus, I have hundreds or thousands of different hope chips. Are you with me? And the reality is when Jesus calls us into relationship with himself, he asks us for all of us, not just part of us. He asks us for all of our chips to be placed in him, not just some of them. And, you, and friends, see, this is where joy is actually really helpful. Of course, joy is a feeling and we experience it. But joy is extremely helpful because joy is also an indicator And what I mean by this is joy will help you identify the areas of your life that are not anchored in Jesus. And I want to encourage you over the coming weeks to ask yourself the question, what robs your joy? You know, what kind of rooms do you walk into and your joy disappears? Because most likely it shows that maybe hope has been unmoored from Jesus. Are you following And it's just like a tree, right? Jesus uses the vine analogy and he talks about fruit. Just like a tree, fruit is a great indicator as to what's happening in the tree. And so if the fruit is not showing up healthy or there is no fruit, there's no joy, well, we probably need to ask some other questions. In fact, this came into sharp focus for me um, in December last year. I uh, was organizing before the busyness of Christmas week to plan a date night for me and my wife. Not even looking. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I thought I'd go to the, the effort of kind of filling the car up with a couple of snacks and getting everything sorted. And I thought we'd go on a Christmas lights journey. Oh, that's so nice. And so I, I spent a couple of hours um, on Google Maps mapping out like 19 stops. So different places we would go with a couple of different dessert spots along the way. It was like, it was pretty good, right? And so I'm walking out to the car, super chuffed with myself, all in Google Maps, ready to go. And I remember hopping in the car, and um, as soon as I hit start, the app crashed. And all of my locations were lost. Don't laugh. (laughs) Thank you. And um, look, I'm not proud of how I reacted. This was like a schoolboy hissy fit. Like, I spat the dummy. I was miserable. I was like, I don't even want to go anymore. This is not worth it. I don't even want to see any lights. I don't want to hang out anymore. I just just want to go to my room and cry. And um, I I felt sorry for Renee because she's like, I just want to hang out. Like, this is not even about Christmas lights or, like, let's just hang out. But I was, like, just so fuming. And, you know, as embarrassing as that is, and you're all looking at me with those eyes, you've done this. (laughs) But I I remember taking a moment to actually reflect on that and think to myself, man, why did I react like that? And as I reflected, it's like a stab in the chest. So I realized maybe, maybe my hope is placed in my ability to control the circumstances for things to go to plan. And when they don't, I have a hissy fit. My joy is robbed. I'm, I'm miserable to be around. And this is where, friends, joy is is an amazing indicator because it allows us to notice the areas of our life that maybe are unmoored from Jesus. And so I want to encourage you over the coming weeks to ask that question. Maybe when you you feel a lack of joy, why is my joy gone? And you see, the more securely anchored we are, the more secure the thing that we've anchored ourselves to, the greater our joy And right at the start of our time together, of course, we read from John 15, Jesus declaring himself to be the true vine 
and he invites us to cling to him, to anchor the branches of our lives in his, and promises that if we do that, we will bear fruit. That's amazing, right? He doesn't say you need to go out and do anything. He just says, anchor yourself in me and you will bear fruit. You don't need to try and squeeze out joy. It'll actually appear on your life. And I love this. And you read this, John 15, 9. It says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, all of the stuff about the vine and abiding and and remaining in my Father's love, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. Some other translations say you will experience fullness of joy. And I love that because what's the joy of Jesus? It's union, right? It's, It's being connected with us and with God the Father. And you see this all playing out in this beautiful passage. But Jesus says something crazy right at the end of it. He says that your joy can be made complete. And I don't know if you've read a a huge amount of the Bible, but for those that have, you'd be quite aware that um, it's very infrequent to hear about something being complete, to be full. Usually the, the call of Jesus and discipleship is about a process and it's about a journey. But Jesus says something pr- profound. He says that your joy may be made complete. And the question is then, how is our joy made complete? And we've already talked about it, right? It is simple. It is about abiding in him, anchoring our lives to him, allowing all of us to be connected to all of him, placing our hope and our dependence in Jesus Use any sort of fruit analogy that you want. It's about union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is where the fullness of joy lies. You see, joy does not lie in the absence of pain or in the presence of prosperity. Joy lies in the person of Jesus Christ. And the question that comes to mind is, what are we to do with all this, right? All this talk of joy. And to be honest, I'm still figuring that out. I don't know. But there's one thing that's been stirring around in my heart uh, across the last couple of weeks, and it's a simple encouragement. It's this. Don't chase joy. Chase Jesus. Don't chase the supply. Chase the source. You see, we live in a, a pursuit of happiness kind of world, right? You know, out to chase down that career that will fulfill you or or uh, get with that guy or that girl who will complete you, or get that new thing that will make you happy, you know, get the, the new computer or the new TV. I got a new TV recently, hey. <laughs> but the reality is, like we mentioned earlier, things and people, they will fail you, they're fleeting. And the problem is, you continue to go back for more, right? You, you keep going back for more and for more and for more, and as you receive it, maybe it doesn't... Um, you know, work out like you thought it would and your joy disappears. Or maybe the crazy thing is your hope is realized, but then you change. And that's a crazy thing. And so no longer does it fulfill you or or complete you. And friends, I just wanna encourage you tonight that in Jesus, you find everything that you need. As you anchor your life to Jesus, you receive great joy, yes, of course, but you also receive peace. You receive forgiveness, you receive wholeness, identity, you receive purpose and life to the full. And you can go around chasing the supplier for the rest of your life, but why would you chase the supplier when you can have access to the source? When Jesus himself invites us to come into close relationship with him and promises us that as we do, fruit will be produced, joy will be produced, peace will be produced in our lives. And the bottom line of this message is actually really simple. It's this, Jesus gives us joy because Jesus gives us himself. And that great joy is available today because Jesus has made himself available. You know, he desires to connect with each and every one of us. And this is beautiful, life living with God. Check this out, Habakkuk, say that three times to your neighbor, go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18, it says this, though the fig tree does not bud, 
And though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Why? Because my hope is fixed in the Lord, in somewhere secure, in somewhere that that is not fleeting, someone that is unshakable. And, And friends, I just wanna take a moment to encourage our church. This is one of the greatest testimonies as to the goodness of God. A people who are joyful in all circumstances. A people who the joy of the Lord is our strength. A people who walk through the fire of life and remain confident because our hope is placed somewhere secure. And I wanna just take a moment to speak to all of the followers of Jesus in the room. And maybe for you, as I've been talking, you've been thinking, well, my hope is placed in Jesus and I do experience that joy. Well, for you, I wanna echo the words of Paul who said it about a billion times, rejoice. In other words, stir up your joy. Don't push it back down. Let it overflow. Let it come out because it's a beautiful thing. In fact, it might be the thing that blesses the people at your work, that allows them to catch a glimpse of the goodness of God. So friends, if you have joy, rejoice. Now, Paul is not saying, if you don't have joy, try and manufacture something, try and just like, your way until you're fine with Jesus. No, no. Place your hope in Him, and you'll experience that kind of joy. But friends, if you have joy, tonight, can we, can we let it out? Can we allow it to overflow out of our lives? Can we choose to rejoice, to to stir it up? Because I think that's a beautiful picture of what the church is called to be, a, a joyful people in all circumstances.